I, Dr. Kavita Singh, Associate Professor of Law, working in WBNUJS Kolkata, has a teaching experience of more than 15 years. My specializations are criminal law, criminology, international taxation, family law. Presently, for the purpose of e part Shala, I am coordinating the paper on socio-economic offenses, which has 40 modules. Today, one of the module will be discussed in the learning outcome of the uh, introduction to socio-economic offense. In India, the government has appointed certain committee to work on some specific offenses, which uh, are actually falling under the category of socio-economic offenses. For the purpose of uh, reviewing the problem of corruption and for making suggestions regarding it had appointed a committee namely Santhanam committee in the year of 1962 which had suggested changes in the legal framework for the purpose of ensuring the speedy trial of the cases relating to bribery, corruption or the cases of criminal misconduct which has helped in making the law more effective. Santhanam committee report while providing uh, suggestions regarding the change in the legal framework which is needed for the purpose of curbing the problem of corruption has also dealt with the concept of white collar crime and had attached a great importance towards it. And accordingly, the report has stated the scenario in which these evils evolved. Advancement in the sphere of technology and science, it resulted in the emergence of mass society where uh, there was a group of large rank of controlling elite who encouraged the growth of monopoly. There is a rise of managerial class also all of which resulted in the necessity regarding strict adherence to the high standard in relation to ethical behavior. So that the new process which have emerged in the social, political and economic sphere can function honestly. This led to emergence of new type of offense that is white collar crime which resulted in the difficulty of enforcement of the laws, these offences is dangerous not only for the reason that the financial stakes are much higher in these cases, but also for the reason of they are causing such damages to the public morals, which is actually irreparable in nature. Socio-economic offences are usually considered to be synonymous with white collar crime, but a deep study into concept reveals the, that although there is an intersection between socio-economic offences and white collar crimes, but latter is narrower in scope. White collar crimes are those which are committed by upper class of the society in course of their occupation. For example, a big multinational corporations guilty of tax evasion. A pensioner submitting false returns may also be committing a white collar crime, but interestingly both are socio-economic offences. Social crimes are those which affect the health and material of the community and economic crimes are those which affect the country's economy and not merely the victim. Hence, it can be safely assumed that socio-economic offences are those which affects the country's economy as well as the health and material of the society. In India, the 29th Law Commission report suggested to take into consideration the Santhanam Committee report of 1964. The committee report observed that the penal code does not deal with any satisfactory manner with acts which may be described as social offences having regard to the special circumstances in which they are committed and which have now become a dominant feature of the certain powerful sections of modern society. In most of the offences that were identified two features could be witnessed economic benefits and unjust enrichment. It suggested that a separate chapter should be included in the penal code to deal with socio-economic crimes. 
White collar crimes, Greek philosopher Aristotle had written about cases of embezzlement of funds by some road commissioner and by some other officials. Even in the Bible and in some ancient religious texts, there were statements regarding condemnation of some exploitative business activities, which have harmful effect over the good of common people. In 20th century, eminent American sociologist namely E. A. Ross has raised his voice against business duplicacies and mentioned that there are some powerful business owners and also some members of executive who have a tendency to exploit people and they do it and they also manipulate marketplaces to fulfill their uninhibited desire regarding maximization of their profits, but while doing so they pretend that they are pious and respectable. Edwin H. Sutherland worked upon the concept of white collar crime throughout his career, but it is also a fact that from his work it can be found that he has not given only one definition of white collar crime, rather he has used several definitions of white collar crime in his works. But definition which is there in his book namely white collar crime is one of the most famous one where he has defined the concept of white collar crime as being a crime which is committed by such a person who is having a high social status and also having respectability which is acquired by him in course of his occupation. Sutherland's definition of white collar crime is therefore built upon three overlapping types of misbehaviors. Number one, any crime committed by a person of high status, whether or not it is done in the course of their occupational activities is represented by the first. Those crimes committed on behalf of the organization by people of any status is shown in circle 2. Com those crimes committed against organizations whether or not they are carried out by people working in the same organization, other organization or none at all. While analyzing the uh, figure, uh, Sutherland focal point is the intersection of the three circles which means that his subject matter covers only those people of high status who use organization to commit crime for their organization against workers, consumers or other organizations including competitors or even governments. Although he had not represented his findings in this manner, his friends and contenders have both now agreed this is exactly what his typology actually looks like. Criticism of Sutherland, one of the main criticism controversy prevailing regarding this approach is according to the view of the Sutherland, he had a willingness in respect of including many of the acts though they had been sanctioned by way of civil or some other cases administrative legal proceedings in the purview of the concept of white collar crime. This particular decision of Sutherland attracted many controversies as many legal scholars contended that only such type of acts that are particularly punished under the criminal law can fall under the purview of the term crime whereas Sutherland contended that there are many cases of civil law violations which are if compared fundamentally are similar to the criminal offences. Herbert According to him, the definition of white collar crime is that it is an act which is illegal or series of these illegal acts which is committed by using such means which are non-physical and <coughs> these acts are done for the purpose of concealment or guilt of or obtaining money or for purpose of avoiding the payment of loss in respect of money or property or for the purpose of obtaining any business and in some cases purpose is personal advantages. Four types of white collar crimes, uh, the first category includes personal crimes which is done specifically for the purpose of personal gain and done in the context which is of the non-business nature. Secondly, uh, it includes abuse of trust where the 
crimes are done by persons in the course of occupation and persons who are operating the portion of inside business by violating their duty towards the employer of loyalty and fidelity. The third category includes business crimes where the crimes are done in furtherance of the business, but there is not the main purpose of such business and lastly the fourth category includes the con games where white collar crime is done as a main business or it is the main activity of the business. According to many uh, critics of empirical research is conducted then it can be found that if theory of Herbert is followed which means if the offence based approach is followed then there uh, in that case in most of the cases it resulted in the uh, in such studies where the studies do not include the particular offences and the particular offenders which actually had drawn the attention of Sutherland in the very first place and it deviates from the concept of Sutherland. If the above mentioned two approaches one of which is offender based and the other is offence based approach regarding the white collar crime is reconsidered it can be clearly understood that they are not contradictory rather they are mutually exclusive both of these approaches actually emphasize on different aspects. Governing the characteristics of the social status of the person who had a tendency to commit these types of crimes. There can be numerous motives behind committing the white collar crime. There may be a motive to pursue high social status, there may be motive of social recognition or there may be motive of pursuing high career, ambitious or sometimes there may be pressure to perform or some peer pressure or there may be some obedience toward the authority or motive of revenge or there may be some other situation which may result in occurrence of white collar crimes in the society. Socioeconomic offences, mens rea is represented by signifying the intersectional point where the three circles that is the white collar crime, the socioeconomic offences and the offences of absolute liability find their common denominators. To state that mens rea play a central role is to uh, say the obvious but for reason for placing the concept of mens rea within the framework of socio-economic offences definitely something has to be said about it. If historical development of these socio-economic offences in India can be traced, it can be found that after the world war there is scarcity of essential things and which resulted in increasing demand of such things and avarice of was breeding among the businessmen and there was a development regarding these types of offences. Then after the freedom and partition of India for lack of good legal administration, administrative control this problem increased and after the urbanization took place these offences became rampant in India and the government started to recognize these problems and appointed different committees to investigate the matter and tried to control the situation by implementing some measures as can be found from the reports of these committees. Types of socio-economic offences, first the test is only to determine whether the economic development and the economic health of the country is being endangered. Secondly, ev evasion of tax, income tax and other taxes. Third is the misuse of the position by the public servants where the individuals or industrials or uh, industrial or commercial undertakings deliver the goods which are not in accordance with the previously agreed uh, specifications while fulfilling the contracts. Fifthly, hoarding, profiting, black marketing. Sixthly, adulteration of food, drugs, etc. Seventhly, offenses which are related to theft as well as misappropriation on the properties or funds which actually belongs to public at large. Eighthly, and the last category deals with the offences related to trafficking in the licence or permits. 
Now, we come to unfolding the era of socio-economic offences. So, offences other than criminal or civil in nature were unheard of till Edwin Sutherland defined a new gene of crime that is white collar crime. Socio-economic crimes like bribery, corruption, nepotism among the persons with high authority and reputation, trafficking in licenses, trafficking in immoral activities, embezzlement, in misappropriation, on manipulation and cheating relating to public property, violation of contractual obligations and others came to be tabled. As society and economy progressed with time and with globalization, cases of new offenses started emerging such as money laundering, smuggling, foreign exchange regulation violations, under and over invoicing, hoarding, profiteering, sharing, pushing, black marketing, tax evasion, theft, adulteration, trafficking in illicit drugs, arms, etc. Sutherland may have introduced the terminology, but socio-economic offences reared its head when the Mughal emperor Farukshyar issued a royal farman by which the British could carry on trade with Bengal, Madras and Bombay free of custom duty or tax. They were given the right to issue dastak or passes for the free movement of goods only in the company's name. This led to corrupt practices of movement of personal goods for personal trades without passing, paying any tax. As time progressed, the deceitful practice of the British, their ways of getting any job done through greasing and palms of the officials slowly eroded and high ethics and morality of the Indian society. After independence and partition, economic condition of our country was in doldrums and with an administration set up uh, left by British which lacked honest dealings, the socio-economic offences grew and finally it spreads its wings with the rapid growth and of globalization. Now we took look into notable features of socio-economic offences. It will not be out of place to highlight the salient features of socio-economic crimes. The motive for such crimes is extreme, agreed and is done by those who covert excessive wealth and huge material gain. There is no emotional attachment between the perpetrator and the victim of this crime. The victims of this crime are seldom an individual but a group of uh, consumers and the state as a whole, the society as a whole is targeted and victimized. The modus operandi followed under such crimes are deceit and uh, enticement but not force. Act is deliberate and willful. The state's duty thus lies in protecting the citizens health, uh, recourse economy from exploitation by an individual or a group of perpetrator, legal control mechanism in India to combat socio-economic offences. The typology of social econo uh, socio-economic offences are different and the legal control mechanism also differs for such offences. Legal control mechanism to combat socio-economic offences are discussed under the different heads. For example, tax evasion, undisclosed foreign uh, income and assets, imposition of Act 2015, the Act to apply Indian resident and seek to replace the Income Tax Act 1961 of the taxation of foreign income. It penalizes the concealment of the foreign income and provides for criminal liability for attempting to evade tax in relation to foreign income. A flat rate of 30 percent tax would apply to undisclosed foreign income or assets of the previous assessment year. No exemptions, deductions or any set off of any car carried forward losses as provided under the IT Act would apply. This would apply from 1st April 2016 onwards. The total undisclosed foreign income and asset of the an individual would include income from a source located outside India, which has not been disclosed in the tax return filed. Secondly, income from a source outside India for which no tax returns have been filed. And thirdly, for value of an undisclosed asset 
located outside India a one time compliance opportunity to person who have any undisclosed foreign assets for all previous years assessment will be provided for a limited period. Such persons would be permitted to file a declaration before a tax authority and pay a penalty at the rate of 100 percent. The relevant tax authorities and their jurisdiction would be as specified under the IT Act. They would have powers of inspection of documents and evidence. The proceedings are to be judicial penalty for offenses, undisclosed foreign income assets will attract penalty for non-disclosure of foreign income or assets would be equal to three times the amount of tax payable. In addition to tax payable at 30 percent, failure to furnish return will attract penalty or for not furnishing income tax returns in relation to foreign income or assets is a fine 10 lakhs. This would not apply to an asset with a value of 5 lakh rupees or assets if a person who has filed tax returns does not disclose his foreign income or submits inaccurate details of the same, he has to pay fine of rupees 10 lakh. This would not apply to an asset with a value of 5 lakh rupees or assets any person who continues to default in paying the tax would be liable to pay an amount equal to the equal amount of areas. We come down to the miscellaneous penalties under this act that has to be levied a person fails to abide by the tax authority in answering questions, signing of the statement, attending or producing relevant documents. He is to pay a fine between rupees 50,000 to 2 lakh rupees. The punishment would be rigorous imprisonment from 3 years to 10 years and a fine of willful attempt to evade tax. The punishment would be rigorous imprisonment from 3, year, three months to 3 years and a fine of willful attempt to evade payment of tax or non-disclosure of foreign assets in returns. The punishment is rigorous imprisonment of 6 months to 7 years and fine for failure or to furnish returns. The punishment is rigorous imprisonment of 6 months to 7 years and fine. Punishment for abatement for any offence under this act, every person responsible to the company is to be liable for punishment. His liability is absolved if the proves that he, the offence was committed without his knowledge. Food Safety and Standards Act 2006, the implementation of the Food, Security, Food Safety and Standards Act 2006 has consolidated 8 laws governing the food sector and establishes the Food Safety and Standard Authority as a regulator. It requires all food business operators including small business and street vendors to obtain a license or registration. The regulation under FSSA relate to the procedure for obtaining a license or registration was not notified on 1st August 2011. According to the regulation, all food business operators had to get a license or registration within one year of the notification. Due to opposition from several food business operators, the FSSA has now extended the deadline for getting a license or registration by another 6 months uh, till February 2013. However, some of the key concerns regarding the law have not been yet addressed. Uh, firstly, the, uh, the organized as well as unorganized food sectors are required to follow the same food law. The unorganized sector uh, such as the street vendors might have difficulty in adhering to the law. For example, with regard to specifications on ingredients, traceability and recall procedures and does not require any specific standard for potable water which is usually provided by the local authorities. Uh, it is the responsibility of the person preparing or manufacturing food to ensure that he uses water of requisite quality even when the tap water does not meet the required safety standards. It excludes plant prior to harvesting an animal feed from its purview. Thus, it does not control the entry of pesticides 
and antibiotics into the food as its source. The uh, power to suspend the license of any food operator is given to the local level officer. This offers scope of harassment and corruption. The act requires a food business operator to get different licenses if articles of food are manufactured or sold at different premises. There are challenges. In, in Madras High Court case, a uh, stay order was uh, on the act and it rules was refused. Since in the in India, transnationally infant children milk, uh, adulteration of milk and its products is a concern and stringent measures need to be taken uh, to combat it. The consumption of adulterated milk and adulterated milk product is hazardous to the human health. As directed by Supreme Court by order dated uh, 10 12 2014 it will be in order that union of india comes up with a suitable amendment in the food safety and standard act 2006 respondent union of india shall also make penal provisions at par with the provisions contained in the state amendments as indicated the uh, prevention of corruption act is another uh, law under the socio economic offences uh, PCA discusses various offences and penalties, but bribe giving is not defined separately as an offence. The commission suggests that the section 7 of this act needs to be amended and include collusive bribery as a special offence. If it causes a loss to the state, public or public interest, then the punishment should be doubled. It, is, it provides that the, in the Prevention of Corruption Act that the previous sanction of the competent authority is necessary before a court takes up cognizance of the offence. But the commission has opined that prior sanction should not be necessary for prosecuting a public servant who has been trapped red handed or in cases of processing assets disproportionate to the known sources of income. The presiding officer in a legislature should be designated as the uh, sanctioning authority for MPs and MLAs respectively. The commission suggests that there is a need to delegate the power of sanctioning authority to the committee of central vigilance commissioner and departmental secretary. secretary. In the case of difference between the two, the matter should be resolved at the level of Central Vigilance Commission. When the sanction is required against secretary, then the empowered committee should uh, comprise cabinet secretary and the Central Vigilance Commissioner. The sanction granted, granting order should be issued within two months. In case of refusal, the reason should be placed before the respective legislature annually. Summary uh, to com come to the conclusion, it is clear from the above discussion that these specific offences are different from, from the other types of offences as these offences cause harm in a greater magnitude. If compared to magnitude of the traditional crimes and these cr offences do not represent the cases of positive aggression or the cases of invasion through these offences generally do not create a direct or immediate injury, but actually they create such type of great danger, the probability of which should be tried to be minimized by the application of the law and the law deal with the situation. The maximum punishment which are prescribed for these types of offences are not high enough to deal with the situation effectively. Actually by the ex maximum punishment, it should be effectively reflected that there is social disapproval of high level regarding these types of socio-economic offences. But unfortunately, that cannot be seen from the situation prevailing now in this country. These socio-economic offences are dealt with courts while dealing with offences of other nature also. So, actually there are no special courts which are established for the purpose effectively and exclusively dealing with these types of offences uh, only. And it creates a significant problem as the courts which are already overburdened with other 
issues have to deal with these offences which are actually di different in nature if compared to other types of offences. There is very uh, chance of uh, getting away from the ambit of the punishment of the offenders as in many cases dealing with these types of offences, it can be seen that the offender who actually involve themselves in these types of offences belong to a higher strata and having a political power to use and get away from altar of justice by destruction of the evidences available against them. So, in these types of offences, there is a very need for speedy disposal of the cases coming before the courts. But unfortunately, the situation prevailing in the country shows that the cases are not disposed of in a speedy manner as is required to deal with the situation. Some suggestions, uh, the legislation which, which are dealing with these particular types of socio-economic offences should be made in a less regulatory in nature and rather than more punitive in nature. The laws which are dealing with these types of offences should be made more stringent so that the evil can be controlled to the extent uh, the maximum punishment which is there to deal with the offence should be increased as it is necessary so that the offenders who had a tendency to commit these types of offences can be deterred. Some special courts should be established which should particularly and exclusively deal with these types of offences and not with any other type of offences. So, these special courts will be less burdened if compared to the courts which are overburdened with other cases. There should be effective and speedy disposal of these types of cases so that the offender cannot get away from purview of the justice where it is found that these offences are committed by business organisations or commercial institutions and they are repeating these types of offences, the organisation should be awarded community sentences apart from heavy monetary penalties. So, that they think twice before indulging in such acts which results in repetition of these types of offences. While concluding, it can be stated that in India, there are several problems of poverty, ill nourishment as well as exploitation which are coming to in the way of economic development of this country. So, apart from these, if offences continue to harm the economic development of the country, then India will not be able to develop as a whole. So, by some stringent actions in the part of the government and by the initiative of the people of India, these problems of socio-economic offences can be curbed to the great extent. Thank you.